Uh, right, yeah, so that's me. Um, my outline of my talk is going to be uh, looking at some of the computing stuff that we've done for the LHC experiments. Um, this thing called NoSQL, which was, so big data is the buzzword at the moment. NoSQL was the bit buzzword about 18 months ago. Um, and it's kind of the enabling technology, I guess. Um, somehow I've got involved in landslide modeling, um, taking some of the ideas from the LHC and sort of reapplying it uh, to that sort of domain. So I'm going to look at that. And then some of the issues that we've found um, and can sort of foresee uh, coming up for universities especially. Um, so yeah, that's me. Uh, I've been doing um, LHC computing for about 10 years and I've started becoming an ecology engineer. I don't know what that is, um, but they pay me money, so that's great. Um, uh, and I've been dealing with sort of multi-petabyte data sets um, for the last 10 years. Uh, basically, we have a very large uh, digital camera. Um, this little guy here, that's a person to give you sort of an idea of scale. This is the small one as well. There's an atlas which is much larger. Um, and at Design Luminosity, this guy will kick out kind of 10 petabytes of raw data a year that's sort of required to be stored uh, long term, which goes to tape. Um, the experiment's going to run for maybe 20 years. Um, all the data that it takes probably needs to be accessible for 50 years, maybe longer. Um, the curation of the data is something that we're not particularly scared of. Um, tape systems are pretty good and we can sort of upgrade them as we go along. Um, the thing that's actually harder, going back to the DCC talk, is curation of hardware and software to actually process that data. So if I accidentally delete the version control system that contains the only uh, copy of the software that can be used to process some data we've taken, uh, then we're screwed. Um, likewise, if the x86 architecture suddenly disappears, um, data that's sort of very tied to that um, might not be processable or might get a different result if you process it again. Uh, we spend a hell of a long time uh, comparing GCC compiler versions before we move forward. Um, so that kind of thing is a bit where people start getting antsy. And if you want to annoy a particle physicist or something like that. Um, this thing, basically, the, the, the photos or the event that it um, records, um, they're about a megabyte uh, each. Um, the design luminosity was that we would record about 100 of these a second. Um, in practice, to date, we've been running at between 300 hertz, so 300 events per second, up to a gigahertz, a uh, thousand. Um, yeah, if you have a design, like if you're, when you're building a system and someone says, oh yeah, we'll never put more than 10 terabytes of data in that a day, they're lying. <laughs> they will do much more. Um, for every event that we uh, record, from, so every actual physics uh, collision that we record, we'll simulate at least as many um, events, if not more, uh, using very mon various Monte Carlo uh, tools to basically be able to compare prediction, which is the simulation, to, to the experiment. Um, we've been, we basically use pretty much any and all technologies that we can get our hands on. Um, so we use Oracle, MySQL, uh, Lustre, GPFS, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but also we've started using some of the NoSQL stuff, so Hadoop, mainly the storage system, um, MongoDB, which is a sort of quick key value store, CouchDB, which is another one of those sort of things. Um, so this is a kind of a hard to read diagram um, of the data flows between various sites around the world. So we have about 180 institutes involved in the experiment um, in 38 different countries. And we have this kind of tiered system. So the tier zero, the, 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 the compute center at CERN, serves data out to the tier ones, which are sort of large national labs. Um, and they then do some processing and then serve that data out to universities um, all over the world. Uh, we need to have this data accessible by about 4,000 people. So that's kind of uh, not a huge number of people in terms of Facebook, but the uptime needs to be about sort of 24-7, 365 days. It's scary how many people submit jobs on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, um, such as life. So we have a very large distributed database. Um, the query language that we use is basically Crufty C++, which isn't great. Um, everyone sort of says, oh, why don't you put it all at one site? Why don't you put it all at CERN? And the main reasons are politics, power budget, and cost. We have to sort of uh, do some money laundering to get it out and put it into universities. <laughs> it's true. Uh, so this is um, some data. This is a, a FedEx is our tool that we use to sort of ship our data around. It also catalogues what files are in what data sets. Uh, and it was developed in Bristol. Um, so we currently have a, a 50 petabyte. So that's a 50,000 terabyte uh, data set where we have deletions here. 
that's where we've sort of removed some Monte Carlo data that we don't need anymore. We've, we've got a better version of it. Um, the system's uh, transferred about 100 petabytes of data to date um, from not very much in 2004 up to sort of fairly continuous running now. Um, this is all done on commodity hardware, uh, Janet, uh, normal networks. Um, and we have this sort of, this very distributed system where we push work out to the data. So you don't sort of open up your laptop and suck in a load of data, you send your data out to a job. Um, and the reason for that was that about the time where people were sort of discussing and thinking about the LHC and how we were going to do the computing, um, this is a plot of uh, things that people at uh, Stanford bought over time. So you can see that sort of disk and CPU are kind of following a nice Moore's law and they were fairly confident that that was going to be fine and we'd be all right. The issue is that um, network looked like it was going to be the big issue, right? It wasn't going to have a good enough transatlantic link to be able to take the LXC data and process it around the world. What happened is that about the time that they were sort of deciding that they were going to have this very pushed uh, system, um, these things called Google and then Facebooks and blah, blah, blah kicked off and suddenly the transatlantic network gets a lot better. So now we're in a regime where actually the network is probably our best resource, um, it's most reliable. Um, and we're now trying to work out ways of breaking that as well as storage and CPU, which is good. Um, when we started doing this sort of planning, there was no Google, there was no Hadoop and tools like that. Um, so everything kind of is a bespoke uh, computing system um, written in all kinds of languages and of various quality and various sustainability. Um, if, it had turned, if the LHC had turned on when we had originally planned for it to turn on, we would have been really, really um, uh, trying to not swear. Um, we would have been in trouble because uh, there was no way that there was enough compute power um, to process the LHC data. Um, similarly, if uh, the LHC just sort of hadn't existed and then popped into existence now, the computing system that we have would be very different. We'd be using uh, tools like Hadoop or whatever. Um, okay, um, so we have the kind of... Uh, I like to think of it as a kind of ladder, and it was interesting that the Sangster uh, talk had a horizontal one, I don't know, um, where basically the, the number of people interested in the data, uh, the more data there is, the more people will be interested in it. And researchers work basically at any level of this data uh, ladder, right? Um, and what the job of the people like me is to do is to try and minimise the number of people who actually have to process a petabyte of data in a single thing uh, and give them sort of some nice... Uh, summarized data set that they can uh, deal with. And so we do this by a period of uh, process of sort of refining the data, skimming stuff out. We still keep all the raw data, um, but the stuff that people actually use on a day-to-day -day basis is sort of factors of 10, maybe 100 times smaller than the raw data. Um, if people have private resources, so you know, a hidden away cluster or um, a very powerful laptop or something, they need to be able to plug that into the system and use it appropriately. Um, and it should be sort of easy to run this job on this massive distributed uh, system over thousands and thousands of files and thousands and thousands of terabytes of data uh, as running a job locally on, on your laptop. It's not yet, um, but it's getting there, it's improving. Um, and sort of th th that sort of thing of moving up and down the ladder requires a great deal of uh, synergy of the tools so that, you know, behaving locally is sort of reflected um, in the large distributed compute system and a lot of integration work. So um, if you haven't tested it, it doesn't work. Uh, and uh, most things don't work because they've not been tested. Um, the other thing uh, that keeps coming up is this kind of idea of letting go of data. Um, getting people to let go of their data we found to be, um, in the first few years of the LHC running, was really hard. Everyone wanted a copy of their data down the corridor so that if, it, um, if the machine that was hosting it died, they could go down and kick the postgrad that was responsible for it uh, and make them turn it back on again. Um, what we found is that by providing a sort of equivalent level of service, not as good, it's, it's a lot harder to run a large distributed system than to run a, an NFS server at the end of a corridor. Um, but if you can find a level of service that's close to that, um, people are actually happy to move on. They, they, you have to sort of let them relax, sort of uh, give in to the system, and then they're all right. OK. Um, so as a physicist, I have to have a, a, a formula in my talks. Um, it's part of the contract, I think. Um, so the formula is this. Oh, it's unfortunately a bit blurred. Um, so S equals G over uh, C sub S over time plus C uh, sub C over time plus the integral of C over N and C plus P over time. Do you want to understand that? No? Okay. Uh, so 
G is uh, over, fixed, and those things are usually fixed. Or if we put it into words, uh, the grant is fixed. Um, the cost of storage and compute over time is, is fairly fixed. We can sort of plan that. We can buy a tranche of hardware and off we go. The integral cost of network we can actually kind of amortize by careful planning. Um, but the cost of people is something that is, uh, that's the place where we can vary that value by giving them more access and more power to do stuff, right? Um, another way to look at this is, uh, the way that other people have said it, is that um, technical problems are actually quite easy to solve. People and political and social problems, they're the things where you get stuck. So yeah, people are important. Be nice to people working on weekends, because they won't work the next weekend if you're rude to them. Um, the cost of the person is the place where you can make savings. So if you can let them do more, uh, let them do things quicker or without having to go through a huge potential barrier to sort of um, work on your data set, um, they will do more and you can sort of make a savings there. The big issue though is building a sustainable team. So you want a bunch of people who are able to do uh, this complicated science or analysis, but they might also have to be involved in some of the sort of operations of the system. They might need to sort of develop the system a bit because it doesn't quite do what they need to do. Um, university funding, so this, this thing has a buzzword in technology companies called DevOps, right? So it's develop and operations combined. Um, and the idea is that this is a team of people who develop and manage the system together. Um, the problem is that university funding doesn't really align very well with that kind of model. Um, this is the sort of model that people like Yahoo and Facebook and Google do pursue because it's a good way of making sure that the system is reliable, um, that if it's something breaks, the person who breaks it probably knows how to fix it. Um, the university system, you've got kind of having a long period of continuity is quite difficult with short grants. Um, and also, you know, industry pay is significantly higher than uh, um, universities. Okay, so what's interesting to me is that big data isn't actually interesting anymore. Um, unless you're basically trying to make a new Google, you don't need to write your own system. Um, doesn't mean it's easy, but it's not, you're not at that sort of forefront of, holy crap, how do we do this? Um, so you can spend, instead of spending time writing complicated distributed computing systems, you can spend time, money, and effort on understanding your problem better so that you can use those systems more effectively. Um, as well as this, the, the, sort of the price of hardware has come down a lot. So when I was in my first year of my PhD, one of the first things I was given by my uh, supervisor was to build a terabyte disk array. It was about that big. <laughs> uh, it cut my finger as I was putting it together. Um, and it was about three and a half, four thousand pounds. Same price now. Um, I can get a 2U 24 terabyte box, and plug it straight in. Easy. Um, so, so the, the commodity hardware is uh, trended to become much cheaper, as you'd expect. Um, and you can now, yeah, you, it's about being able to use that hardware effectively. Okay, so NoSQL um, is this enabling technology of the big data movement, uh, along with the cheaper storage stuff. Um, most of the systems are kind of designed for kind of big web scale applications targeting large cluster deployments where you can sort of scale out um, for sort of a data point. Um, Yahoo clusters are kind of multi-petabyte um, systems and they're run by one person. Like they're, they're designed from the ground up to be cheap to run, cheap to buy. You put a container, fill it with disk, plug it in, you know, power, network, and then if half of it goes down, you worry about it. If, if a disk dies, who cares? You've got thousands of them. Um, so they can experience massive economy of scale, and that means that they can run these things um, relatively cheaply, and, and you know, their business, they've got to make money. Um, NoSQL is an intentionally provocative name um, that's been kind of sanitized a bit by marketing departments, I guess, by, into big data. Um, it was also kind of a poor name. Um, it's quite catchy, and it's provocative. But a lot of the systems actually have kind of a SQL-like interface, so it's a bit silly to call it NoSQL. Um, nowadays, you don't really need to write your own systems. Um, you've got software as a service vendors who you can sort of go to um, and say, hi, can you do this for us? You can download the source from, like, say, Hadoop is an Apache open source product. You can just go and download it, run it, install it. Um, it's also been largely commoditized by vendors, so you've got sort of EMC or Oracle. You can go and buy a an Oracle Big Data Appliance, costs you a quarter of a million quid or whatever, plug it in and you've got a Hadoop system. Um, 
What's interesting is that a lot of these NoSQL tools are um, open source software, um, and I think that collaboration is really vital. You need to actually have, because the problem is so large, you need to have lots of people involved in it who are testing different pieces of the problem, so that you can, so, you know, the problem that you maybe experience one in a thousand times, someone else maybe experiences once a week, and so they can fix that problem, you don't have to worry about it, and you fix the problem that you see, and both of you benefit. Um, the other thing with NoSQL stuff is that they're um, massively tuned towards specific use cases. So if your thing is a very, very relational database um, and you're using Hadoop to process it, you're probably not doing it right. Um, you also might find that the system does almost what you want to do, but not quite everything. And so you'll need to sort of get involved, use the source, um, adapt the system and extend it a bit. Um, some people sort of tried to sell NoSQL as a sort of silver bullet that solved everything. Hands up people who believe in silver bullets. Good. Uh, it's no panacea. Uh, anyone who tells you that it is is lying and trying to sell you something is usually. Um, another thing is that they're kind of, because they're sort of interesting and trendy and buzzwordy, people sort of go, oh, yeah, we could do this and we can process this many files and stuff. And it's, uh, it's, it's amazing. Um, but actually, if, if your problem is to deal with 10 files, deal with 10 files, don't deal with 10 million. So avoid the technology lust, right? Um, Similarly to the, the sort of silver bullet side, there was also a, the converse pushback that was uh, NoSQL is totally useless and you people just need to go and learn how to use SQL properly. Um, and that was unjustified as the silver bullet thing. Um, this initial perception, I think, is now waning. Um, oh, you just got the end, right? Uh, good. Um, and Oracle, like uh, vendors like Oracle, EMC, getting involved, the, the big data meme kind of kicking in. Um, means that people are moving on and starting to think these things are actually quite serious and useful products. Um, there's still a lot of reality distortion fields out there, just um, be warned. Um, the main thing that uh, NoSQL kind of gives you is a different tool set, right? So when all you've got is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. That's MC Hammer if you're um, older than about 40. Uh, <laughs> maybe 45? Um, so it gives you uh, alternative solutions, right? It doesn't mean that you're going to stop using Oracle for your HR database, say. Um, you will always find relational data, and the relational database is a very good, very established technology to use. Um, NoSQL stuff tends to be somewhat uh, less forgiving than SQL databases in terms of queries and more forgiving in terms of your schema. So one of the things that NoSQL stuff nearly all sort of benefits are is that you don't have to worry about writing a schema anymore. Yay. Um, if you then want to do a query on something that's arbitrary, you've probably got problems because you haven't got a nice scheme in the way to sort of uh, bind your query down to. Um, individual, like NoSQL is a broad term, obviously. Uh, individual tools in that space provide different um, benefits and costs um, and often provide sort of features that you wouldn't expect um, from a traditional database. So one of the databases we use is this thing called CouchDB that's a web server as well as a database. And that's really useful for the particular use case that we have. Um, I suspect that it's impossible to find a single tool from the NoSQL sphere that solves all problems um, because such a thing is a silver bullet and they don't exist, remember? Um, so spending a lot of time on actually studying what your use case is and studying the various technologies is actually what you need to do. Um, you don't want to sort of buy into a large Hadoop stack when you've got a fairly small amount of data and it would fit into a MySQL database and it would work better out of MySQL. So you've got to understand the problem you're trying to solve and then choose the appropriate tool, hopefully one in big uh, leather pants like MC Hammer. Um, okay, um, so NoSQL sort of general stuff. They were good for sort of, um, sort of NoSQL combined with cloud, um, sort of similar technology maturity. Um, and they're very good for sort of internet startups who don't really care if they lose the data. Um, they want to show off their cloud score, but um, great. Um, they're also good for the sort of the large companies like the Yahoo's and the Facebooks who can build these gigantic data centers that are customized and really, really purpose built for, for their problem and, and build a large DevOps team to run it and maintain it and, and tick along. Um, how that fits in with university researchers, I'll come back to in a bit. Uh, but you can obviously see that universities aren't really at either of those two sort of, this is where it's good. Um, we're smaller than the large companies. We have a much larger exposure to risk than a um, cloud or something. Um, and a lot of the benefits that NoSQL have are these kind of uh, soft benefits. So benchmarking and comparing product A and product B, uh, while you might get a number, is actually wrong. Uh, it doesn't make sense. You're comparing apples and oranges. So it, 
choosing your right tool is actually quite difficult, basically. Okay, so LHC, computing evolution. As I said earlier, if we were building the thing today, uh, we were defining the computing system, it would be different. The current system works um, really well. We publish papers, we can ship data around, as I showed you in that illegible um, circle diagram. Um, but it's run at a very high staff cost. So we have people who are on call 24-7 to um, make sure that various bits of the thing that we know are kind of hokey or whatever don't fall down. Um, we know that that's unsustainable. Uh, we're not happy with it. Um, so over the next kind of few years, we'll start simplifying, retiring, hopefully retiring bespoke components in favor of something that's generic. So something like Hadoop maybe isn't appropriate, but maybe it is, and we can um, maybe sort of subvert it to our needs or whatever. And so you, you can move along that way. Um, the other side of it is that the actual, because we've got so many bespoke components, the software maintenance uh, becomes quite difficult because you know a researcher does some stuff, writes some code, is influential, whatever, and then gets picked up by Google or Yahoo or Facebook or whatever. So, so they move on and then someone else has got to maintain that code and it's probably a very complicated system that someone spent three or four years thinking about and designing and developing. Um, and you can't just learn it overnight. So, so it's, it's high staff cost both from sort of the operational side and also maintaining the software that runs the systems. Okay, so that's kind of uh, coverage, or broad coverage of the sort of NoSQL big data stuff and the LHC computing. Um, the thing I want to talk about now is, is reuse. So we're, we're taking, uh, Bristol got a, a knowledge transfer grant to take experiences and tools and techniques from the Park Physics Group and reapply it to a, a completely new um, domain. And it turns out that um, Bristol has this sort of world-leading group of uh, landslide modelers. Um, and they work with the World Bank um, to sort of help plan uh, disaster recovery from various landslide issues. Um, so the idea was to sort of take these ideas and these tools uh, and, and apply it to their problem. Um, landslides are a, a fairly major problem, in, uh, especially in developing countries. Um, this is uh, the El Nino 9798 event. Um, if this is a, not a log plot, they're about the same value. So, so the, the amount of money that Ecuador spent on cleaning up El Nino is about the same as US. But US GDP is much larger. Right? So this is a huge problem for Ecuador. For US, it's like, oh, it's a pain in the ass, but it's not so bad. Um, so the, so the downside modelers kind of have this, um, uh, they've got about 30 year worth of work developing their software that does all these simulations. They don't want to rewrite that to use some new system. Um, they don't want to learn complex data management tools because uh, they're landslide modelers, they're not data managers. And they don't want to worry about managing hundreds or thousands of jobs in a system that's complicated and scary. Um, they also have some quite interesting use cases. So they need to have a system that's usable by uh, people distributed all over the world. Uh, which is familiar to us, um, but they also are very non-expert field engineers. They're, they're not computer literate necessarily. Um, they need to have an expert approval step. So if someone puts in a simulation where you've got a slope that kind of has some kind of Escher <laughs> uh, geometry, you need to be able to kick that out before you start it off. Um, it's got to be usable on sort of low, cheap hardware, low end cheap hardware, um, and they need to run sort of thousands of simulations per uh, slope and storm and analyze, analyze those results. So they basically need a nice GUI interface. Uh, using mobile phones or tablets or cheap laptops for both data entry and the analysis. Um, so I'm going to quickly skip through uh, some a, slide, a few slides on um, the complexity of their problems. They have they want a single slope with a single angle of uh, cutting back, um, produces one file and takes a quarter of an hour to, to run their, their system. If you increase that to sort of 25 different angles, so you're actually doing some planning and saying, is it better to cut it really steep or shallow? Um, then it's obviously 25 uh, times the number of files, takes 25 times as long. If you then put in stochastic parameters, so uh, measurements that you're not unsure of and you're sort of varying, or the amount of rainfall varying that, um, it increases as you'd expect until they end up with sort of 31,000 hours of CPU time or three and a half years, which is obviously not very useful if you've got a storm coming in a week's time. Um, and that's for one storm, right? They, they need to simulate many, many different scenarios. Uh, you know, a regular storm versus one in 100 years, one in 1,000 years type ex expected event. Um, and they can, easily pr uh, they can easily pull out more stochastic parameters to vary and vary them in a more fine-grained manner. Um, and they also probably want to start looking at things like 
uh, if I run it with this version of software, I get this result. If I run it with this version of software, I get this result. Which one's the right? Which one's better? Um, so we're basically we're able to solve the sort of this side of things by parallelizing this stuff using the um, LHC computing grid that GridPP and others have developed that was mentioned earlier. Um, so we've got a nice parallel problem and it's solved, right? Yay. Um, but it makes a whole new one, right? They've able to do all the processing, but they've now got masses and masses of data that they don't understand how to use. To date, what they use is an Excel spreadsheet, like probably everyone else. Um, but now they've got data volumes that are in sort of giga, uh, terabytes of data. They can't just email around a, a terabyte size Excel file. I think they may have tried. It doesn't work so well. Um, so yeah, to, to, to solve these sort of quite uh, reasonable use cases, they can't do it with their current um, manpower or tools. So they come to us, we sort of talked about it. Um, we've ended up with a system that looks a bit like this. So you have uh, this thing called Big Couch, which is a, a fork of CouchDB um, that runs in a clustered environment. Now, CouchDB is um, the nice thing about the reason why we chose CouchDB is that it's got a, a very simple API, you just, and you can just talk to it through a web browser. So it's nice, simple. Um, you lose some performance because you're talking over HTTP, um, but it's ubiquitous and it's nice and simple. Um, we store sort of a summary of results from the simulations um, and then the full result as an attachment to that uh, metadata so people can sort of do further investigation if they want to on the full raw data set. Um, and then the other thing that Couch has is this sort of incremental MapReduce uh, system so you can build secondary indexes to find other stuff. So we can build an index that says, show me all slopes that fail and we can pull that out very quickly. Uh, so yeah, they were sort of happy with this and we were you know, thinking it was a week's work. Uh, this stuff, this is where the grid kicks in. Um, and they go, oh yeah, we've got one other use case. Um, we need to access the result data in St. Lucia. And we said, yeah, we knew that, it's fine. Um, but yeah, we need to do it when there's been a tropical storm and the telecoms infrastructure's all gone. And you say, oh, right, so you need to look at something in Bristol on the other side of the planet when there's no link between, oh, that's kind of fun. Um, fortunately, uh, Couch again comes in here um, it's got possibly the easiest database replication I've ever seen. You type replicate this to there, and it does it um, all over HTTP, so you don't have to worry about kind of caching, or, or rather you can put caching in, you don't have to worry about that sort of scaling and stuff. Um, so people can, in the field, upload results to their local thing or to the, the main central server, and then we replicate the stuff backwards and forwards, uh, and you see the same interface from both systems, and then you get result data back down there, and, and visualize it through a web browser, either talking to the server in Bristol or one on your phone. Um, and that's incredibly powerful and incredibly great. Um, and this kind of thing is this sort of Web 3.0 is a, is a vague enough word that I'm going to steal it and decide it's mine. Um, but combined with sort of HTML5, we can have very data rich applications accessed via the browser, um, powered by these big data tools. So these huge data processing things ends up resulting in some nice simplified data read by the browser. And so now the focus becomes on the, the user interface end and hiding that complexity out of the system. So it's query builders and planners. Um, you're seeing things in Hadoop where you've got interfaces to things like R and MATLAB already are appearing. And then from the drivers, from the industry end, you've got sort of better ad, ad targeting, production suggestions, um, things like Square where you can sort of have an online bank and you can see all your transactions over time. Um, and this is arguably a return to sort of the web's origin of um, a science place. So, so for the landslide stuff, this is our visualization. Based any of these points is a measurement that some guy in the field has taken. You can drag them around if you don't believe him. Uh, the blue line tells you where the water table is. And these sort of circles here tell you whether or not that um, slope is stable, where it's going to slide away. And it's all rendered client side using JavaScript and a fairly modest browser, which is awesome. Um, so last thing is about how this is a going to impact universities. Um, data intensive research is already the norm for a lot of fields and will become the norm for the rest, basically. Universities will need access to big data resources. Um, and one of the interesting things is that you, you'll, you'll start seeing significant use from non-traditional fields. So uh, people will want to store their entire DVD collection of students' uh, performance videos or whatever, and then want to index it and do interesting stuff with it. Universities need to be able to provide that resource to be able to uh, um, do interesting research. And the other thing is that big data and NoSQL are these empowering technologies. So they, they basically will generate new fields, right? You, you will find, I don't know, there'll be 
something that people had never expected or always wanted to do but not been able to because they couldn't access enough compute resource um, to do it. Going back to this workflow ladder, you've got this idea of there's sort of stuff at the top which is done centrally um, for the benefit of everybody and then stuff at the bottom which is done privately or shared between you and your friends. And I think there's a fairly sort of nice um, alignment with some of the, the NoSQL and big data tools that you sort of have something like the big yellow elephant of Hadoop sitting at the top doing sort of multi-petabyte data processing, something like Couch, uh, Big Couch in the middle that's able to sort of distribute and share trivially your data sets. And then something like Couch itself on, uh, at the end user level where you can have your data on your laptop for the, the thing that you're particularly interested in. Um, Okay, so other implications for the future. Uh, quality and scale of big data resources um, are going to have a direct impact on the ability of a university to do research at an international level. US universities, for instance, um, certainly ones involved in CMS, have much bigger compute centers than we have in the UK, um, and they're much better funded. And that's going to cause problems, right? Um, we also need to provide uh, data intensive compute resources to complement HPC. And the reason for that is that. Um, Big data clusters are very different architecturally from HPC clusters. This sort of whole thing of you know very expensive storage system, thin little network pipe, loads of CPUs, doesn't really work if you're trying to process multiple petabytes of data. You need to have the storage as close to the compute as possible. Hadoop did this very well, where basically you, you use the disk inside the machine that's doing the processing. It's also harder to manage um, data-intensive systems than HPC systems because data is stateful. If something um, if a CPU doesn't work, you turn off the machine and it usually comes back to life. If you do that for a disk, the disk corrupts itself, grinds to a halt, and you've lost that disk. Um, you also have interesting legal issues that um, people much more expert than me will tell you all about. Um, so how do we... There's also this sort of thing of uh, software as a service and vendors such as Cloudant who are excellent. You should uh, totally buy them. Um, uh, but these, these sort of services, software as a service vendors are quite hard to realize at an institutional level because they don't really, um, because they expose the cost so well, right? Because you say this costs you uh, 500 pounds per terabyte or whatever to store this data, uh, researchers suddenly have to sort of scrabble around and find money down the back of the sofa to do it, and it makes it much, difficult, much more difficult to actually sort of fill up and use appropriately. As I said earlier, building DevOps teams is something hard and university funding um, doesn't really support it very well. That's, I believe, been recognized in recent EPSRC fellowship calls on um, software development for novel research. Um, so so there, are, there are big issues coming out of the big data stuff for universities, basically. OK, last slide. Um, big data is mainstream. Um, it's hard to get computer scientists excited about it because they think it's a sole problem. It's not, because it's an engineering problem, as we, people were talking earlier. Um, but it should be seen as an enabling technology for all academics, right? You don't need to be a hardcore coder um, to do something interesting with a large data set anymore. It's not trivial to adopt if you've got existing code or systems in place based on um, Excel or whatever. You're going to have to do some work. But it's also not horrendous anymore. Um, and it means that universities are going to need to start building up teams to support these activities. They're a new uh, activity. Um, or find a way to outsource it to either another department, so like we've done with the landslides, or maybe to another university or a national lab, or to a company like uh, Cloudant, or, um, well, I'm sure there are other ones as well. Um, that's my uh, talk. Thanks very much, Simon. I've let Simon overrun slightly, so I'm not going to go for questions at this point. We've got a tea break, um, so I'm going to let you get away upstairs for tea. Uh, back at uh, quarter to four, please, for our last talk and then our last closing keynote. Thank you.